All right, today we're going to be looking at the physics paper one. That's a multiple choice core paper. And we're going to look at that for 0625 paper 11, the May, June 2016. And this is for the CIE IGCSE examinations. So let's have a look at that now. Let's face down the beast. Question number one. The diagram shows an enlarged drawing of the end of a metre rule. It is being used to measure the length of a small feather. What is the length of the feather? OK, let's look at this and let's see what we get here. It's at 10 millimetres. And up at the other end we have 29 millimetres. So the total length will be 29 millimetres minus 10 millimetres which is 19 millimetres. Option A. Next one. A train begins a journey from a station and travels 60 kilometres in a time of 20 minutes. What is the average speed of the train? Ooh, interesting, look. They're asking for the average speed of the train, but the units here are metres per second. Now we've been given a time of 20 minutes, so let's convert that to seconds. 20 minutes multiplied by 60 seconds per minute. Well, that's going to give me 1,200 seconds in total. All right. So why do we want that at all? Well, because we're being asked to calculate, calculate the speed. Speed is just distance over time, which is then distance of 60 kilometers divided by 1,200 seconds, which gives us 50 meters per second. Option C. Question three, two runners take part in a race. The graph shows how the speed of each runner changes with time. Now, what does the graph show about the runners at time t? Now, both runners are moving at the same speed. Runner 1 has zero acceleration. Runner 1 is overtaking runner 2. Runner 2 is slowing down. All right. Now, let's look at that. So they come together here. And if we look at it, what it means is that they both have the same speed. So the answer is A. A. Both runners are moving at the same speed. So how do we know it's not B? Runner 1 has zero acceleration, because acceleration equals change in velocity, or in this case change in speed, over change in time, and the speed is changing. Runner 1 is overtaking runner 2. Well, that'll happen when they've travelled the same distance. It's not about the same speed there. Runner 2 is slowing down. Also not true. Runner 2 it still has an increasing speed that's happening, so they're still speeding up. Question number four. A cup contains hot liquid. Some of the liquid evaporates. What happens to the mass and what happens to the weight of the liquid in the cup? Okay, well, let's see. Start off with some liquid in a cup. Some of it evaporates. What that means is over time, there'll be less liquid in the cup, which means less mass and weight equals mass times gravity. So less mass and less gravity. So let's look at our answers. As always, I'll just mark whole sections that apply for each bit. Mass decreases and weight decreases. The answer is A. Question number five. An object has a mass of 50 kilograms. The gravitational field strength on Earth is 10 newtons per kilogram. The gravitational field strength on a distant planet is 4 newtons per kilogram. What is the weight of the object on Earth and what is its weight on a distant planet? Right. Well, let's write this down. First of all, our equation for weight. Weight equals mass times gravity. As we start running through that, let's see. So we have a mass of 50 kilograms. Let's look at the weight on Earth. 
will be 50 kilograms multiplied by 10 newtons per kilogram, which is the value we're using for gravity here, and that's 500 newtons. So G is just the gravitational field strength. It's also referred to the gravitational acceleration. So you might see it written, indeed it is at the start of the, the paper, as 10 meters per second squared. Okay, the distant planet, which is the weight of somewhere else we don't know. Somewhere else we don't know where. Now, so the weight on somewhere else we don't know where is 50 kilograms multiplied by 4 newtons per kilogram. And that gives a value of 200 newtons. So it's newtons in every one of those possibilities. And D is our answer. Because weight is a force that's measured in newtons. Even if we don't know where the place is, the weight will still be measured in newtons. Question number six. A student wishes to determine the density of an irregularly shaped stone. First, he finds the mass of the stone. Next, he lowers the stone into a measuring cylinder containing water. The diagram shows the measuring cylinder before and after the stone is lowered into it. Ah, I'm on the edge of my seat. There we go. Stone and stone out of water, stone in water. Exciting. Now, how should the student calculate the density of the stone? Well, let's have a look. First things first, let's put down our equation for density. Density equals mass over volume. So you need the mass, you need the volume. So the way to do this equation then is the mass of the stone divided by the volume of the stone and the water, which is reading 2, minus the volume of the water, reading 1. So that is option D. Option D. There we go. Question 7. What is an example, or which is an example of a force? Energy, power, pressure, or weight? Well, we've already stated before. We'll do it again quickly. F equals M A, W equals M G, and gravity is an acceleration. There we go. So the answer is D. It's weight. Energy is measured in joules, power is measured in watts, pressure is measured in pascals, weight is measured in newtons, and force is measured in newtons also. Right, question 8. The diagram shows an object of weight W and an object of weight Z balanced on a uniform metre rule. Which equation, relating them all, is correct? Hmm. Okay. Well, what do we know about this situation? One, we know it's balanced. And if it's balanced, then the anti-clockwise moment is equal to the clockwise moment. Oops. And the moment is just calculated by force times distance. So the force, well, we've got the weight of an object there multiplied by A. This is for the anti-clockwise moment on the left. W times A has to be equal to the clockwise moment on the right, which is... Z times B. There we go. And that gives us option C. Question 9. A skier walks from the bottom of a ski slope to the top and gains 10,000 joules of gravitational potential energy. She skis down the slope. At the bottom of the slope, her kinetic energy is 2,000 joules. How much energy is dissipated in overcoming friction and air resistance as the skier moves down the slope? All right, let's see. So she starts off with 10,000 joules at the top. And by the time she gets to the bottom, she's got 2,000 joules of kinetic energy, which means she is missing 8,000 joules of energy. And that's the energy that's gone into overcoming friction and air resistance. It doesn't just disappear, it has to go somewhere. She's kept the 2,000 joules in form of her movement, so the 8,000 joules must have been lost to other, to overcome other events coming down the slope. So that gives us option B. 10. A coal-fired power station generates electricity. Coal is burnt and the energy released is used to boil water. 
The steam from the water makes the generator move and this produces electricity. Which watts are used to describe the energy stored in the coal and the energy of the moving generator? All right. So the energy stored in the coal, well, that's a chemical. Chemical potential until it's released. Okay, and the energy of the moving generator, well, here's the key, it's moving, it's kinetic energy. All movement energy is kinetic energy. That kinetic just means movement. Okay, so coal, chemical, the two possibilities, generator, kinetic. There we go, it's option B. Geothermal, of course, being just to do with hot rocks under the surface of the earth and hydroelectric to do with creating electricity from moving water. 11. Four different children run up the same set of stairs. For which child is a useful power to climb the stairs the greatest? Hmm. Okay. Let's see what we're doing here. We've got work done equals M G H. Work done is mass times gravity times height. Power equals work done over time. Now for each one of these kids that are running up the stairs, they're running up the same height, so G and H are going to be the same. So what I'm going to say is that power is approximately, well, power is proportional to mass divided by time. Is it proportional? Yeah. What do we have to multiply it by? Mass and gravity, sorry, gravity and height. And that will give us the actual value of the power. So what I want to do then, I've got power is proportional to mass divided by time. And what that means is I want to find the rho where the mass over the time is the greatest. The biggest number from mass divided by time. So let's see what numbers we actually get. This one here, the first one, 40 divided by 15, gives us 2.67. Next one down, 50 divided by 25, gives us 2. Next one, 60 divided by 25, gives us 2.4. And finally, 70 divided by 15, gives us 4.67. This is the biggest number. That represents the child who's developing the greatest useful power. So the answer is D. So one more thing about uh, question 11 is if you're not overly sure about doing it with proportions, you can make up a value for the height of the stairs, say 10 meters. Why 10 meters? Because it's easy to multiply things by 10. You don't want to take a longer time to do the run through. Oh, you know what? You can make it one meter. It's even easier. It doesn't matter. The comparison will still work out the same and you'll get the same answer. Question number 12. The diagram shows three vases with the same base area. Each vase, each vase uh, contains water of the same depth. Which statement about the water pressure is the point P, Q and R connect? Well, you know what? Before I get confused by the answers, first thing I'm going to do, pressure in a liquid is density times gravity times height. They're all made of water. So rho is the same. Gravity doesn't change for any of them. And the height of the liquid, it's the same. So before I even do anything, I know that by looking at it, by using this equation, I know the pressure in each of them is the same at the bottom at P, Q and R. In fact, that gives me straight away answer D. Answer D. There we go. Question 13. The diagram shows a simple mercury barometer. The atmosphere pressure increases, which distance increases? You know what? Before I'm even going to do this question, what I'm going to do is draw a little arrow on it. As the pressure increases, what we see happen is W will get higher. So W actually increases. And that means that W gets further away from X, it gets further away from Y, gets further away from Z. So let's look at it. Which distance increases? Well, we know W is moving. A, V, W, well, they actually get closer together. So we know it's not that one. It's not this one because V, W is one of the few things that gets smaller. As W gets closer, that distance gets smaller. Starts off big, gets smaller. B, W, Y, yep, 
as W moves up, the distance down to Y gets bigger, so that's absolutely correct. XY, well, as W goes up, X goes down slightly, because there's only so much mercury gets pushed down from there. And DXZ, well, X again, if it's approaching Y, it's also going to approach Z. Okay, so the only answer there, B. And of course, there should only be one answer. 14. Which statement about evaporation is correct? It, well, let's talk about what evaporation is before we answer it. Evaporation is that thing that happens at the surface of the liquid where molecules have, some molecules have more kinetic energy than the others, and some of them have enough kinetic energy to escape the liquid. So they escape the liquid and they take more than the average amount of kinetic energy with them, which is why the liquid itself gets cooler because of it. So let's see what the options are. A. Evaporation causes uh, the temperature of the remaining liquid to decrease. Well, that's absolutely true. B. Evaporation does not occur from a cold liquid near its freezing point. Ah, it kind of does, actually. Uh, C. That's why triple point of water is called a triple point, because you've got uh, steam, you've got water, and you've got ice. C. Evaporation does not occur from a dense liquid, such as mercury. Ooh, it comes from everything. That's wrong. Everything's a liquid. D. Evaporation occurs from all parts of the liquid, only the surface. 15. A gas is stored in a sealed container of constant volume. The temperature of the gas increases. This causes the pressure of the gas to increase. Good. Maybe. What happens to the gas molecules during this pressure increase? All right. We got a tank. There we go. Tank. So the gas molecules moving around. What happens when you heat them up is they move faster. They move faster, greater number of collisions with the walls, uh, collisions with each other, therefore, well, so let's go with collisions with the walls, so the pressure increases. And let's look at what the possible answers are. A, the average kinetic energy of the molecules increases. Well, you know what, that's true, because if they're moving uh, faster, then they've got more kinetic energy, so that's true. B, the average separation of the molecules decreases. No, nope, that's rubbish. C, the average separation of the molecules increases. Also not true, they're all stuck in a tank. Nowhere to go. D, the volume of each molecule increases. That's not true either. There we go. All right. 16. A substance loses thermal energy to the surroundings at a steady rate. Here's a graph showing how the temperature of the substance changes with time. We've got a couple of bits labelled point P and point Q. So before I look at the rest of the question, let's just see what these bits are. We have... Um, likely a gas. This bit here, gas becomes liquid. This bit here would be a liquid. Just a standard curve, standard cooling curve. And this would be liquid to solid. That's the way things tend to work. The temperature decreasing over time, the gas is cooling to become a liquid. The liquid is slowly changing to become a solid. What portion, or what could the portion PQ of the graph, of the graph represent? Well, a liquid getting colder, I think. And that is answer C. There we go, liquid cooling. A, gas condensing, that happens up on top. Gas cooling, here we go, gas cooling, gas changing into liquid. Liquid solidifying is down here. C is that bit there, the liquid cooling down. 17, a student wishes to check the upper and lower points of an, on a fixed scale thermometer. She has four beakers, P, Q, R, and S. Uh, beaker P contains a mixture of ice and salt. Beaker Q, beaker Q contains a mixture of ice and water. Beaker R contains boiling salt solution. Oof, don't get too close to that. Beaker S contains boiling water. Which two beakers should she use to check the fixed points? Okay, well, you know what? Celsius scale has got two fixed points that define it. One is uh, boiling water. And the other one is melting ice. They're the two temperatures that define it. So what are we looking at there? Melting ice, beaker Q is, uh, here we go, beaker Q, mixture of ice and water. Beaker S contains boiling water. So there we go, we want Q and S, which is option D. 18, the same quantity of thermal energy is supplied to two solid objects, X and Y. 
the temperature increase of object X is bigger than the temperature increase of object Y. Which statement explains this? X has a lower melting point than Y? Nope. So it doesn't say anything about melting. Uh, B. X has a lower density than Y? No. Uh, water has a lower density than lead, but water takes a lot of energy to change temperature. C. X has a lower thermal capacity than Y? D. X is a better thermal conductor than Y? No, do with a fixed solid object there. Okay, so let's just run through this, what's actually happening here. Whenever we deal with this type of question, what we have is, if you like, energy equals mc delta t, change in temperature. The energy required to heat an object equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. But here, what we can do, if the mass doesn't change, so we can change that to be energy equals heat capacity multiplied by change in temperature. All right, so let's look at this again. The temp so same amount of energy going in and the energy increase in X. Oops, sorry, not the energy increase. Let's do this C delta T. Let's just show how I do these questions. Okay, so the temperature of X, the temperature increase in X is bigger than a temperature increase in Y. The energy in the X, it goes into X is the same as the energy that goes into to Y. So, I've got a small temperature and it's equal to these two things multiplied together. I must have a large thermal capacity. If I've got a large temperature change and I must have a th small thermal capacity. There we go. Think of it like, uh, because it's C delta T, think of it like uh, 10 times 5 equals 50. This would be the energy. If I know the other one is 50, and I know that the temperature is changed by 1, then suddenly C must be 50. 1 gets bigger, 1 gets smaller. So if it's a bigger temperature change, it must be a smaller thermal capacity. And that's answer C. X is a lower thermal capacity than Y. 19. Liquid is heated in a beaker using a mysterious heating arrow. The density of the liquid is, just seems to be floating in midair. It's not even held in anything. But it does have a liquid labelled liquid. It's reassuring. The density of the liquid changes as its temperature increases. This causes the energy, or causes energy to be transferred throughout the liquid. Ah, oh, excellent. How does the density change and what is this mysterious energy transfer process? Okay, let's just talk about this. First of all, it gets hot here. As it gets hot, the molecules have more kinetic energy, they push further apart and the density goes down. So it moves up and round and cools down and comes back again. And you get these convection currents moving round. There we are. So. How does the density change and what is this energy transfer process called? Well, the density decreases. The energy trans transfer process is called convection. There we are. And B is the answer. And that's generally how radiators work. The air tends to get warmed up near them and it travels about the room, across the ceiling, back down the other side as it cools down. That's why they're quite effective ways to heat a house. 20. A rod is made half of glass and half of copper. Four pins A, B, C and D are attached to the rod by wax. The rod is heated in the centre as shown. The pins fall off when the wax melts. Which pin falls off first? OK. So let's just examine this slightly. Glass is a bad conductor. So in the length of time it takes for this much glass to get hot, copper, which is a good conductor, will have this much copper heated. So it takes a long time for the heat to travel along the glass, but it travels very quickly along the copper. What does that mean? Well, the wax holding on the pin at C will melt, and the pin will fall. That will be the first pin to fall. OK, so which pin falls off first? C, the one that's on the good thermal conductor. 
Let's look at the next question. 21. Which row shows the nature of light waves, sound waves, and X-rays? Okay, so we're looking at longitudinal and transverse. Light waves look like this. Maybe even more expertly done, I guess. This is a transverse wave. X-rays look pretty much the same, obviously. Much shorter wavelength. So <laughs> I guess we would be more like that. Point being, they're transverse waves as well. Sound waves are pressure waves. They're called longitudinal waves because the molecules in the wave move in the same direction as the, the direction of travel with waves. Light waves and X-rays are both transverse. Sound waves are longitudinal. So, light waves are both transverse, sound waves are longitudinal, x-rays are transverse. The answer is C. There we go. Radio waves are received by a house at the bottom of the hill. The waves reach the house because the hill has caused them to be diffracted. Diffracted, they're just bending round the hill because of the wavelength. I always remember the difference between diffraction and refraction by thinking about diffraction gratings because the light is just being spread out. Okay, 23. The ray diagram shows the image of an object formed by converging lens. What is the focal length of the lens? Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Now, there are three lines that you draw when you're drawing an object. First is straight along to the middle of the converging lens and down to, oops, yeah, down to the focal point somewhere over here of the, the uh, other side of the lens. The other one straight through the centre of the lens. And the final one is straight through the focal point on the same side of the lens. Which means this bit here is actually the focal point on this side of the lens. And the distance between that focal point and the centre of the lens is 40 centimetres. So the answer is A. 24. The diagram shows the dispersion of white light by a prism. Which row would be correct for the colours seen at X, Y and Z? OK, let's very quickly do this. The light comes in, turns towards the normal, and then as it gets up here, and it's about to go back into the air, it turns away from the normal again. Blue light turns more. Red light turns less. That's why sunsets are red and not blue. During the day, the sky looks blue. But in the evening, as the sun's going down, the sun or the sunset is red. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, at X, I would expect that to be red. At Z, blue or some such colour. What do we have as options? Violets. Okay, so violet. That's fine. And Y would be a colour in between red and violet, which is pretty much any other colour. Yellow. There we go, that's the one given to us. So X, Y, Z, red, first one, yellow, violet. The answer is B. 25. Why can ultrasound not be heard by humans? Well, it's actually because the frequency is too high. See, it takes a lot of energy to move, if you like, the eardrum. Now, for low frequencies, that's not a problem. Up to 20 kilohertz, not a problem. As you get above that, though, it takes progressively bigger amplitudes to be able to move the eardrum at all. That's why, if you like, uh, you see a similar effect in speakers. If you look at the big bass speakers, they're huge. Yeah, I can certainly get them pretty big. Um, if you look at the tweeters, the high pitch, high frequency things are much smaller. There we go. 26. A sound wave has a certain amplitude and a certain frequency. A second sound wave is quieter and lower in pitch than the first sound wave. All right, so it's quieter. What does that mean? 
that means that the amplitude will be smaller. It's lower in pitch, so the frequency will be smaller. So the second sound wave has a smaller amplitude and a smaller frequency. Option D. Question 27. Which statement about a magnet is correct? A magnet attracts a gold rod. No, nope, that's not correct. A magnet does not attract a plastic rod. That is correct. Doesn't really attract plastic, doesn't do anything with plastic, really. See, a magnet never repels another magnet. Yes, it does, or it can do. D, a magnet sometimes repels something that isn't magnetised. No, no, that's not true at all. 28. A student wishes to make a permanent magnet. She has iron rod, an iron rod, and a steel rod. Which rod should she use to make the permanent magnet? Hmm, is this rod a hard magnetic material or a soft magnetic material? All right, let's just get this out of the way now. Hard magnetic material doesn't lose its magnetism. Soft magnetic material loses its magnetism at normal room temperature and it does it very quickly. It doesn't mean it's soft. It can be really, really hard. It's just magnetically soft. Which is, you know, no consolation at all if, uh, if you accidentally hit yourself with a piece. So the question is, which rod should she use to make her uh, magnet? And she should use a steel because iron is magnetically soft. Physically very hard, but magnetically it's soft. Type of magnetic material is steel. Steel is a hard magnetic material. It maintains its magnetism. So the option C is the answer. 29. The circuit shows, uh, shown includes two meters X and Y cor connected correctly. Um, here we go. So which row gives the unit of the quantity measured by X and the unit of the quantity measured by Y? Right, well, both X and Y, they're outside of the circuit. They're sitting across the components they're interested in. They're both voltmeters. Ammeters have to go inside the circuit. Voltmeters stay outside of the circuit. So meter X and meter Y, they're both voltmeters. Here we go, that's option D. There we are. A polythene rod, number 30, a polythene rod is rubbed with a cloth. The rod and the cloth both become charged as electrons move between them. The rod becomes negatively charged. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if it's negatively charged, it's got more electrons. So some of these negative electrons have moved over to here. So which diagram shows how the rod becomes negatively charged? We want to see some electrons moving over to the, uh, the rod. There we go. And as the electrons move over, the remaining cloth becomes positively charged. It is B. Thirty-one. What is the function of a relay? A relay is what you've got in your car. When you put your key into your car to start the car, I mean, the battery might be pulling 400 amps, up to 400 amps to start the car. You wouldn't want all that electricity going through the key because it would melt it. Be a huge amount of heat. So what it does is it's using one small electric circuit to control a much bigger, more powerful one. So 31, what's the function of a relay? A, to allow uh, a current in one circuit to operate a switch in another circuit. Hmm, I'm going to go with yes for that one straight away. B, to prevent an electric shock by earthing a metal case. No, that's called earthing something. C, to protect the circuit by melting if the current becomes too large, no, will that a fuse? And D, to transfer a DC voltage to a different value. Hmm, to transform a DC voltage to a different value. That would be tricky. You'd have to, uh, oh, I'm assuming, put it through an inverter and then a transformer and then back through another thing turned back into a DC voltage. Alternatively, you could stick a resistor in front of it and that would make it a more rubbishy DC voltage. Changes the value. Just not, not, not sure how useful that would be. Oh, then, of course, you could also use a voltage divider. That would work. 32. The circuit shown contains three ammeters, X, Y, and Z. Which ammeter has the largest reading? Okay, let's just look at this. So, some current goes through X, some current goes through Y. All of the current goes through Z. So, Z has the value of X and Y. 
So which ammeter has the largest reading? Z. There we go. 33. The diagram shows part of a circuit used to switch street lamps on and off automatically. In the evening, it gets dark. Okay, well, before I do anything or read any further ahead in the question, what happens to an LDR as it gets dark? As the light goes down, the resistance of our LDR goes up. Now, let's find out what the question is. Which row shows the effect on the resistance of the LDR and on the potential difference across it? Okay, as the resistance increases, the potential difference across it will also increase. Why? Because we've got a weird little equation, which is uh, voltage across our component equals the component of the resistance of the component we're interested in, divided by the total resistance, multiplied by the supply voltage. You may recognise it as R1 over R1 plus R2 multiplied by Bs. There we go. That's the voltage across R1. All right, so as R1 gets bigger, the vo uh, voltage across it also gets bigger. So, resistance of the LDR will increase. There we go. The potential difference across the LDR will also increase. Option D. 34. A domestic circuit includes a 30 amp fuse. This protects the wiring if there's too much current in the circuit. In which wire is the 30 amp fuse positioned and what does it do when it operates? All right. Key point, you should always put a fuse into the live wire. You want to make sure there's as little live wire in your circuit as possible. So you're going to want to put it into the live wire. And the operation, it's a fuse. It melts. And it melts and it disconnects the circuit because it was a part of the circuit and it breaks. So the circuit is then broken. 35. A strong electromagnet is used to attract pins. Uh, what happens when the current in the coil is halved? No pins are attracted, some pins are attracted, but not as many. The number of pins, the same number is attracted, and more pins are attracted. Well, what actually happens is the magnetic field gets smaller. The magnetic field gets smaller, the magnet is less powerful. It's still a magnet, but it's less powerful. So we get some pins attracted, but not as many as before. 36. The diagram shows a transformer. The input voltage is 240 volts. What is the output voltage? Okay, primary coil 800 tons, secondary coil 40 tons. Now, because I did a course where I basically teach how to remember all the different equations for GCSE physics, I can tell you straight away that VP NP over BS NS is the equation that relates the voltage and the two different numbers of tons. So I want to find the output voltage. BS, that's going to be equal to VP multiplied by NS over NP, which is then just, there we go, input voltage 240 volts, multiplied by NS, which is 40 tons, divided by 800 tons, and that will give me a value of 12 volts. There we are, that's option B. Number 37, how many neutrons are there in a nucleus of uh, the nucleid chlorine, se uh, 3717. All right, let's find out. Neutrons are given by the number of neutrons plus protons minus the number of protons, which is just 20. So the answer there is B. 38. A certain element has several isotopes. What do we mean when we say isotopes? Well, it means we've got the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Okay, so which statement is correct? They must have the same number of electrons orbiting their nuclei. Now, they don't need to have, they could be ionized, it could be an ion. B, they must have the same number of neutrons in their nuclei? Absolutely not. C, they must have the same number of nucleons in their, in their nuclei? Nope, still no. And D, they must have the same number of protons in their nuclei. Yep, if it's an isotope, it should have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons, which means different number of nucleons as well. It may have more or less electrons depending on whether or not it's been ionized. That would be a, a good reference point, a good starting point, but it's not, if you like, as important as the number of nucleons and the number of protons. Right, 39. 
a radioactive nucleus emits either an alpha particle or a beta particle. What are the products of these two types of radioactive emission? Okay, if it emits an alpha particle, it's going to lose two protons and two neutrons. If it emits a beta particle, it's going to lose one neutron and gain, oops, that's, good. that's a better one, and it's going to gain uh, one proton. So, product after an alpha emission. It's going to be a different element, certainly. It's going to change from one element to another. And after a beta emission, it's also going to change to a different element. Because the element it is, is controlled by the number of protons. In both of these cases, the number of protons is changing. Why is it controlled by the number of protons? Well, the number of protons controls the number of electrons around it, and the number of electrons controls how it bonds chemically. Okay, so the answer is A. Nucle after alpha emission, nucleus of a different element. After a beta emission, it's a nucleus of a different element. Of course, over time, it will become more stable and eventually it will stop emitting radiation. 40. A reading is taken every 10 minutes on the number of emissions per second for a radioactive source. The table shows readings. That's asking us to find the half-life of the source. OK, so it starts at 800. We're interested in when it becomes 400. When it's half the value, and that takes 20 minutes. Now, just to check, when I look at 400, I should be able to go another 20 minutes and get 200. Yeah, there is. Or another 20 minutes and get 100. So the half-life is 20 minutes. The time it takes to drop to half of its original value is 20 minutes. And the answer is B. There we go. Excellent. Well done. So, if you liked the video, please feel free to hit like and hit subscribe. I'm going to be trying to upload about five videos a week, probably one a day weekdays. Um, just to try and help you guys out. And if you've got any special requests, feel free to leave a comment down below. Have a lovely day.